Amen. So there's this story. I was scrolling on my phone one day, and then I was like, this, is, this is, can't really be true. It says 70-year-old, 71-year-old man locked up in P. Ridge. I said, what? What does this old man did? You know, he's old, 71. Sorry. Well, this is what, the, what I'm thinking in my head, okay? And the story goes along that this man, <laughs> him and his neighbor were enemies for years. And his neighbor passed away and he was still living. And so then the, the, the daughter made a complaint to the cemetery. She said, every time I go to the cemetery, there's a dead animal on my dad's grave. Every time. So they got curious of who was doing it. And so when they went and set up cameras, and so um, the, the girl put a, a stuffed animal on, on her dad's grave. And later that day, the old man came, and he exchanged the, <laughs> he exchanged the bear for a dead animal. And they had to get a brand new tomb because just the nastiness of the dead animal was all over the tomb. And the old man went to jail. Oh, wait, I got to tell this part, too. I'm kind of paraphrasing the story. One time, they, because they was trying to figure out who it was. So one night, he put a wig on. <laughs> and he covered up his license plate. And he had, like, two dead animals, the, the way how it was worded. He had two dead animals, okay? And then he put it on the deal. And so they finally caught him. And it was a 71-year-old man, and it was his neighbor. And all this time, he held the grudge. <laughs> he said, well, he's still dead. And the funny thing is, it was over a little small piece of land that they fought over. And he's been dead for years. And this guy's been holding this grudge. <laughs> and he hated him so much. He would take dead animals and place it on his grave. Like, hey, bro, what you in here for? I've been in jail a couple of times, okay? So it's like, what you in here for? You know, drugs, alcohol, beating up somebody, all kind of crazy. I'm in here because I put dead animals on a grave. <laughs> I hated that guy so much. I put dead animals on his grave. <laughs> Sorry, that tickled me. <laughs> but unforgiveness would take you in levels. You will go down levels of craziness because of the unforgiveness that is in your heart. And so Pastor Chantry asked me to speak on the liberating power of forgiveness. There is freedom and there is power in forgiveness. Now, all last night, I think I pressed on this one word to Google so she could read it back to me like a hundred times because I can't pronounce it, so I'm going to butcher it, okay? <clears throat> it's uh, pronounced <laughs> astogenesis imperfecta. Oh, there we go. It, it is a disease that causes weak bones that break easily. It is known as brittle bone disease. Sometimes the bones break for no reason at all. Autonogenesis imperfecta can also cause many of the problems such as weak muscles, brittle teeth, and hearing loss. And it simply deteriorates your bones until ultimately you die. Another disease that we're all familiar with is called ALS. And it's a disease that attacks the nervous system, that controls, that controls the voluntary muscle movement. In ALS, motor nerve, uh, blah, these words gets me. I can't see how these doctors can pronounce these things. Neurons, motor neurons, nerve cells that control muscle cells, okay, and are generally lost when someone gets ALS. As these motor nerves are lost, the muscles they con that they control becomes weak and non-functional. And so I use these two diseases in that story that I told. I use these types of diseases to relate to unforgiveness. Unforgiveness can break you down. 
and it's a weight. It makes you unfunctional. Unforgiveness can be a heavy, heavy burden that you carry around. Unforgiveness is like a poison or a cancer. And if it's undetected, it can be a, a silent, a silent destroyer. Hmm. Because why, when you have unforgiveness in your heart towards a brother or a sister or even God, you will begin to do unrational things. For example, as I was praying and kind of asking God what to speak on this unforgiveness, and he, he told me this to say that someone in this place that he was going to drag here tonight, you have unforgiveness towards him. And having unforgiveness towards him, you simply begin to allow things to wither away in your life. And ultimately, you have a non-relationship with him because unforgiveness. Unforgiveness is a powerful tool of the devil. And he uses it to constantly cause confusion. That's why the scripture explains to us a house divided against itself cannot stand. That's why in your marriage, because of the unforgiveness in your heart, that's why the house is undivided. And ultimately, it would not stand because of the unforgiveness that we hold against one another. There's power in having unforgiveness in your heart. And that power will control you and deteriorate you and destroy you and destroy your relationship with God. Because having that unforgiveness in your heart, it causes you to have all this bitterness. It causes you to have this anger towards this certain somebody. And it causes you to, and, and the devil plays at, at that as a tool and he manipulates your mind. And then he begins to tell you, this person don't love you anymore. And then your mind begin to create these images of how much you hate this person. And this person has been sitting beside you and been trying to explain to you how much he or she loves you. But the unforgiveness that is in our hearts is a poison and it's killing us. But we don't see it because it's silently destroying me inside. And now I'm sitting here with a smile on my face, but yet I am bleeding inside because I have so much rage caused by my unforgiveness. Psalms 19, 12. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Hmm. Matthew 26 to 27, Matthew 26, 27 through 30, 715. Then he took a cup and when he had given things, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. There's different levels of forgiveness. And I'm trying to break this all down in a little 30, 35, 45 minutes I got, okay? And so there's the forgiveness from God. And we have to understand, once God has forgiven you, you have been forgiven. For there is no condemnation. There is no condemnation. Once God has forgiven you, you have been forgiven. He said, this is my blood the, of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. And Romans 5, 8 says this, but God demonstrated his own love for us. In this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Tap your, well, we can't tap our neighbors anymore, huh? and tell them forgiveness. Forgiveness. For even though I was a sinner, Christ rolled himself in flesh. 
He dwelt in the among us. And he was beaten. And he was mocked. He was spit on. And they would take a nine-tailed fox. And, and that's what they called it. And they began to beat him and rip his flesh. And as the blood would begin to pour out of his, out of his wounds. And they would beat him so bad that when he was hanging on the cross, they couldn't recognize who he was. Because ultimately he did that. Because why? Even though I was a sinner. Christ died for us and in that I am set free from the bondage that the devil has tried to place on my life. I am free from an ultimate destination of hell. Why? Because our God loved us so much. He died for us. He shed his blood for me. He shed his blood from you. Because he loved you. And that's the one, ultimately, forgiveness. Now, I'm not making a doctrine out of this, but one time I heard this and it was pretty cool. God said the cross goes two ways. You know, you got the one that sticks straight up and you got the other one that goes sideways, right? So he, he was explaining it was, you have your relationship between you and God, and then you have your relationship between me and you. So ultimately, forgiveness is between me and God. And then the next one that we have to work on is <laughs> between me and you. <laughs> and I don't know why Pastor Chantry asked me to talk about forgiveness. Because, you know, we all wrestle. Sometimes I, oh boy, if I go down with my mind really thinks, you think I'm crazy. <laughs> but man, when I get so mad, I don't want to forgive this person. At all. I hate your guts. I don't want to forgive you. You've done wrong to me. Anytime somebody has done wrong to us, mm, we want to hold that grudge. And so I'm going to take those dead animals. <laughs> and I'm going to place it on your grave. Because that's how much I hate you and I don't want to forgive you. And we all struggle with that to some degree. And in Ephesians 4, 31 through 32 says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. Watch this. Just as in Christ God forgave you. It's not even on my notes. I'm going to jump down a good rabbit trail. But God said, love your neighbors as you love yourself. And I would say there's a type of loving forgiveness. Because he loved me so much that he died for me to forgive me for my sins. And then I believe there's a loving forgiveness. And 1 Corinthians 13 tells you love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy. And guess what else it says? Love holds no record of wrongs. Record. <laughs> if you had a record, well, you know, ooh, now I want that to get expunged real fast. <laughs> because I don't want that on my record. I need that gone because when they run that background check on me, they know what I did was wrong. But after I apply that blood into my life, when they check that record, the only thing they can see is the blood they cover me with. And so you tell that to the devil, I've been covered by the blood of Jesus. And so I have no records of wrong. So when I'm looking, woo, when I'm looking in that mirror and I'm face to face with my transgression and I'm face to face with my depression and I'm telling myself that I don't love myself because this record that I keep seeing coming in my face because all my shame and all the guilt that's trying to attack me, you need to say, shut up devil. When God died for me, he held no records of wrong over my life. So I'm set free from that bondage of depression. I'm set free. Hallelujah. I'm supposed to be teaching. <laughs> and so we're supposed to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. 
And so when that when I'm trying to say is there's a loving forgiveness that when you tell when I look at my brother or my sister and I tell you I forgive you, I hold no more records of wrong. Now there's a difference between a wound and a scar. There's a difference between a wound and a scar. Because you still can see the wound and all the nastiness with inside the wound. You can see it's still blood and if you don't take care of it, it will get all nasty and gross and green. And, and then we take that and we put a patch on it and we think we're okay. And we try to wash it off a little bit, but it's still infected. But there's a difference between the wound and the scar. The wound says that I am still bleeding, but my scar said that I am healed. But this is what happened in my life. Now I can share my testimony to you and tell you what God has bought me from because I've been healed of all that old wounds. So all the old wounds and scars in your heart that people have done you wrong. God has sent you here tonight to tell you if you lay it all down to me tonight, I'm going to make your womb heal and it's going to turn to a testimony scar. Yes. Hallelujah. Man, that's, I might have to watch this tape again because I'm preaching to myself. <laughs> but Christ has died for your forgiveness. And now, when I was reading this one, this one was kind of tough to me. It's in uh, Matthew 18, 15 through 19. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. And if they listen to you, uh, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two uh, uh, others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen... <laughs> Tell it to the church, and if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or tax collector. He said, truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. And again, truly I tell you that if you two of you on earth, oh, excuse me, if truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they will ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For the, where two or three gather in my name, there I am in the midst. And we take that scripture and was like, oh, two or three gather in the midst, so oh, he's going to be there. But ultimately, he's talking about unity between one another. So, brother, if you want to see the kingdom continue to grow, sister, you want to see the kingdom to continue to grow, we got to take our lips off each other and we have to love and forgive one another. I'm trying to preach something tonight because God is trying to take this church to another level. And if we want to see thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and we want to see the presence of God come into this place when two or, three, two or three gather in his name, he will be in the midst and that will only happen when we have unity with one another. Then Peter says, you know, Peter, Sometimes I feel like I relate to him. <laughs> then Peter came, said, hey, Jesus, Lord, how many times? Because he's trying to get away with it. <laughs> That's the kind of question I ask. You know, Lord, you know, should I smack him or not? He cut me off in traffic. <laughs> I had to catch myself a few times. Because one time I jumped off the work truck, but we ain't going to go down that road. <laughs> and I was like, God, how many times do I need to forgive him? Just this once? Uh, no. <laughs> then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sinned against me? See, he didn't say how many times, you know, I, I sinned against somebody. He was worrying about himself. Well, how many times should I forgive them when they sinned against me, Lord? He said, up to seven times? And Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times. But 77 times. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> For my wife has to forgive me 
all day long. <laughs> you gonna do the dishes? What dishes? <laughs> Forgive me. <laughs> Oh, man. I need to stop because I could go down the line. I need to finish preaching because God's going to do something amazing. <clears throat> How many times you should forgive your husband? Seven. Seven times. How many times you should forgive your wife? Every single time. How many times you should forgive your brothers and your sisters? 77 times. I'm about to almost close with this one. <laughs> almost close. And I'm going to paraphrase him. He's talking about the unmerciful servant. So the unmerciful servant, he, he was a guy, he owed somebody something. <laughs> and we ultimately owed somebody something. And so he runs to the king and he asks the king, oh, king, forgive me of my debts. Because the king was about to take him and his whole family and put them in prison and enslave them until they could pay their debts off. But he ran and he was so sincere about the debt that he had to pay. He was begging for forgiveness. Oh, king, oh, merciful king, forgive me. So the king forgave him. And wiped away all his debt. See, there's a difference between free and living free. See, when you're living free, you're still thinking about the debt that you owe, but you kind of hold it back and it kind of hinders you. See, but when you're truly free, <laughs> you can walk in this bad boy smiling. So remember that. When you walk to God and you ask him to forgive you, your debt has been completely paid off. So now you are completely free. But watch what this guy does. This servant goes back home and somebody owed him some money. See, there we go. When you owe me money, I'm coming. <laughs> me and my whole army coming with me. You owe me some money. <laughs> I don't play about my money. <laughs> So, but he decided that he was going to beat and choke the person that he owed money to, that that person owed him money. But he forgot that, that he was forgiven. See, he got him in his relationship with God, right? He was forgiven by God. And then he forgot, as us church people do, we forgot that we used to be there. And we forgot that we was there. And now it's time for somebody else, so us to pay back that mercy. We forget that somebody forgave us. But now I'm about to choke him. <laughs> I need my money. I got bills I need to pay. And you owe me, so I want what belongs to me. And he's choking and he's choking and he's choking. And he's beating him up. And somebody say, hey, you can't be doing that. So he ran and told the king. And the king looked and said, not the God that I forgave. Not the guy that was sitting at the bar drinking and was drunk and was slopping and falling all over the place. No, not him. I didn't forgive him. And now he's sitting in the pew and he's looking out there and like, them old rascals, they need to get me. You know how we get sometimes. But don't forget, such was some of us. that We once was there. But God has forgiven us. And it's our job to show mercy and forgiving one another. When we do something wrong. Stop beating me over the head for my failures. Don't beat the person over the head who struggled with their relationship with God and they left the church and you're talking bad about them and gossiping about them. Then they come back and you sit there and look at them sitting on the church pew thinking they're doing something. But, but remember, you was there too, but nobody didn't see what you did. Sorry, that's a pastor move. <laughs> I'm evangelist. <laughs> if you don't like my preaching, I promise I got good crawfish, okay? <laughs> but it's all serious, though. 
we have to forgive one another. Amen. Stand with me, please. It's 731. <laughs> but now, as I preach this sermon, here's the good stuff. I believe God, I know it's Wednesday. Forget that it's Wednesday, but ten like it's Sunday night. I miss those sometimes. Forgive me. <laughs> But some of you right now in this moment underneath the sound of my voice as I've been chipping away like a doctor before they do open heart surgery they have to remove the flesh first then they got to get in there and start moving some things around before they can actually get to your heart. So that's what's my hope today is to try to get to your heart to where you allow the word of God to sink in for this moment because you've been having unforgiveness in your heart for so long now. It's caused you to get bitter at one another. It's caused you to get bitter towards God, but God is reaching for you one more time. He's reaching for you again and he's telling you if you just let that go I will become an override on you and let my presence fall on your life that will begin to break every chain and every yoke that the devil has tried to place in your mind and on your heart I'm telling you now I feel it in the Holy Ghost. I could call you out if you want me to, but I'm telling you now, it's rather better for you to come freely to God than me to call you out because God said he's about to work a miracle in your marriage right now. If you allow him to, God wants to heal somebody's marriage, Pastor Chantry. I don't know why I'm on that, but I'm telling you now, it's all going to start when you say, I forgive you. <laughs> 